Two, three, say word. One, two, one, two, three, word. And uh, as we turn the pages of Scripture, let's turn the attentions of our heart to the Lord in prayer. So, um, 1 Kings 3, and let's, let's pray. Father, as we, as we unpack your word today, may we receive your truth with zeal and affections, growing affections, Father. Plant seeds of affection in our heart that grow and, and bloom and, and are multiplying in our hearts. There's just affections for you. Bless us, O Lord, to receive your truth, receive it well, intercede beyond my feeble inadequacies to just preach your word and have your, your word touch, transform our lives, echo in our hearts and minds, and, and just bless us. God, we desire your blessings, and may we approach you in a posture uh, ready to receive what you are giving us, Lord, and, and not in a posture of defense where we try to fight off the blessings that you're, you're offering us and you're giving us. May we receive, O oh Father. Some of the blessings you give us are not the blessings we would seek for ourselves. Some of the blessings you give us are things that, that we, we only acquire through, through trial, through testing, sometimes even through pain and growth, God. So, so some of them we're not naturally inclined to receive, but, but put us into a posture to receive even the difficult blessings that are ultimately good for us. And praise you, praise you, praise you, Father. God, we pray for our sister who just went to the hospital a few minutes ago. Just pray that you just you're just blessing her with this quick healing that everything's okay, and uh, just just bless us and and even the kids ministry right there. That just I hear them having a great time. Father, bless them too, and equip us through this time today to serve you well. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 All right, you know, you know the reason we do this every week, right? It's because I want you to bring your Bible, I want you to be in your Bible, and right now we're in a series called The Whole Story. Every week, the sermon's coming from the Bible reading plan so that you can read the Bible ahead of time and then be ready for the lesson. So you're already kind of able to do some of the homework, and I'm giving you kind of a, a free pass today. Next week, we're going to be in week four. Today, we're in 1 Kings 3, which was prior week's reading. The reading plans are on the guest table out front, so you can grab one on your way out or get it online. But we will be in week four next week, beginning 2 Kings. Today, to introduce our conversation, I want to play a game. It's a quick game. It's an easy game. It's a simple game. It's a game called What If? And here's how you play. Are you guys ready? Amen, family? Amen. Okay, here's how we play. I say what if, and I ask you one question. And uh, you just come up with your own answer to the question. It's that easy. What a great game, right? All right. What if, you guys like that game? Man, am I fun or what? <laughs> okay. Um, what if, what if God offered you anything? What would you ask him for? If God appeared to you in an audible voice and said, ask me and I will give it. What would you ask for? Anybody brave and want to answer two or three people? What would we ask for? To be alive. To be alive? All right, he's giving you that one right now. <laughs> Otherwise, we've got to have a weird talk. Okay, <laughs> but that's good. That's good. Life, life. That's actually in the text today. What would we ask for? Freedom from your addiction. Good, good. Ooh. Man, that's a good answer. Ooh. That's a tough act to follow. What else? <laughs> this, by the way, the game's a competition. Who has the best answer? <laughs> Anybody else? Just one more. What would you ask God for? He said anything. What was that? Wisdom. Somebody cheated. He was at the first service. Okay. All right, here's what I want to do today. Um, I'm, we're going to study an account where God does that very thing, where he says, hey, I'm going to give you anything you ask for. And he does it. First, what I want to do is I want to introduce a key thought for today's study, and then we're going we're to kind of hang out in that key thought, then we're going to get into the text, and we're going to study a time where God does that, okay? So here's the key thought, and then we're going to get to the text where God offers Solomon anything. And the key thought before we get to that is this, is that God is blessing you right now. 
See, before we talk about the posture of receiving any blessing from God, let's talk about the current state of being in the blessing of God. Amen, family? Before we start requesting from God, let's look at what we have from God right now. Okay? And you are blessed, you are blessed right now. And, and you know what? I hope everybody has things that you ask God for. I hope you have a list. I hope you have an inventory that there are things that you methodically and routinely and regularly and, and quote-unquote religiously ask God for because you know Jesus and love Jesus. And in your relationship with him, you communicate to him and you talk about those types of things. That's what I hope we all have. But at the same time, Um, alongside the requests we want, we must acknowledge the blessings we have. Amen, family? Let me say that again. Alongside the requests we want, we must acknowledge the blessings we have. Okay? So so let's acknowledge that right now we are blessed. And you guys ready for that conversation of how blessed you are right now? You can talk about this in a metaphorical sense. Right now you're blessed. And you can talk about this in a literal sense. Right now you're blessed. Like, in the most literal sense... You are blessed right now. Literally. You're worshiping Jesus. You're in a state of blessing right now, Jesus worshiper. The delightful person right next to you, even if they smell bad, you're blessed right now, worshiper of Jesus. With luxury and freedoms and amenities. Arguably beyond what most cultures have experienced throughout the history of of existence. Blessed right now in the most literal sense. And even if we lost some of the luxuries and freedoms we have and we were worshiping in a persecuted state, you would still be blessed right now because you get to worship Jesus. Blessed right now in the literal sense. Or, but we could, we could even say in a maybe more metaphorical sense, you're blessed right now. Perhaps your work is going really well. Perhaps you got a promotion or a raise or just the kindness of your employer. But that blessing, that kindness from your employer is not only the kindness of your employer because all good things come from God. And so that that kindness of your employer, that job recognition is also you being blessed right now by God. You're blessed right now. Or perhaps maybe you're in the blessing of expecting because Restore Church Yankton Campus is having a baby boom right now. I don't know what's in the water, so we had Dan put a Culligan thing over there just because <laughs> of the water, you know. Um, so, <laughs> but maybe you're in this season of expecting, and that's your blessing, right? And, and that's, but that's not just something you cherish between yourself and your significant other. That's also a blessing from on high. Amen, family? You're blessed right now in, in a literal sense, in a metaphorical sense, and, and maybe, maybe you're in a situation that's less than these fun ideals. And, and maybe, maybe right now your job's a struggle or you have a friendship problem and you just can't get through it and, and you're, or you're dealing with some sort of addictive thing or, you know, whatever. And you're in this season not of expecting but in a season of testing. But I'm telling you the testing is still a season of blessing. Amen, family? Even in the testing, you're in this season of blessing. And maybe you can't see it right now, and maybe you will not see it until now is in hindsight. Because God truly meant what he said when he promised that he works all things for the good of those who love him. And so maybe you can't see it right now in a season of testing and trial and struggle, but you're in a season of blessing right now. You are blessed right now. Is this landing okay, family? Amen? You're blessed right now. And we cannot talk about the blessings we hope to receive without taking inventory of the blessing we have. That would be irresponsible. And and I want to give you this kind of example to to kind of add some some legs to that, what I've just said. Um, I saw this story from another church the other day. They kind of made this story to make fun of some of the silly ways we ask for blessings as Christians. It's playful but meaningful, Okay. And this woman, she's, she's driving through a parking garage, going to a, like a, a big mall or something, and it starts out, she's just, she's just praising God's name on high. By the way, our worship team, they could, do, they could do the halftime show, I think. They just crushed it, leading in praise today, didn't they? Um, somebody call who the NFL, I don't know. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, that a boy, Royce. Royce has Royce got it. Royce is calling the NFL right now. He's got the commissioner of the NFL on speed dial ready for that. Um, the, so this woman, she's driving through the parking garage, and she's just praising like we just were. She's just praising Jesus. And, and she's like, God, my Father in heaven, I love you. I thank you. You're so good. Uh, I am your child, and I delight in the, the gospel of Jesus Christ that saved my soul. And by the way, God, maybe you could give me the front parking spot right now in the parking garage. <laughs> And, and as soon as she prays this prayer, guess what she sees? Front parking spot open. And as soon as she gets to it, this lady is just walking so slow in front of her that someone else sneaks in and steals her spot. And so she's pretty defeated. You know, she, was, she really buttered God up for that one, and, and he, he, he came through. And, you know, the, the, the devil likes to steal, kill and destroy, and he stole from her that moment by... That other person who mischievously... Anyways, 15 minutes later, she's, that, she's the most dreaded place you want to be in the parking garage. The roof. Because you, there's always something you have to do to get from the roof to a door to another door to get to the entrance. You know what I mean? Anybody been there? She's on the roof and she's defeated. The worship has left her heart at this point. She's been 20 minutes in the parking garage to go to the store for 10 minutes. I don't know what she's doing. And... When she goes, she gets out of her car, and she's kind of defeated, and, but then she notices, then she notices this little girl who wandered away from her mom, who's taking care of all the other siblings, and she's right behind this car that's backing up. They can't see her. She's, they cannot see her. She's about to be toast. She runs over, she gets the little girl, saves the little girl, reunites the little girl with her mom, and now she's walking into the store with a smile on her face. And what I want you to understand is the woman was not only blessed when she saved or walked away from reuniting the girl with her family, she was blessed 15 minutes prior when somebody stole her parking spot. In the time of testing, she was still in the season of blessing. Amen, family? And I want us to take an inventory right now of the blessing blessings we have right now as we look at being in a posture to receive the blessings that God still has for us. Amen? And so here's, here's what I want to get at, and then we're going to stand for God's word, is so often, so often and so easily we would complain and criticize God for the blessings we do not have or we're not receiving, okay? But so often it's not that God's not blessing, so often it's that we're not in a posture to receive his blessing. God teaches us to pour, not to store, and God is generous in pouring into our lives. And so often, the blessing of God comes into our lives like this. He's pouring, and instead of being in a posture of receiving, we're blocking the blessing, and we just let it pour through our fingers, and we're not taking the blessings available to us. Are you tracking with me, family? Today's message is called, Don't Block the Blessing. Okay, let's stand and be blessed as we read God's word together. 1 Kings 3, verse 3 through 9. The word of the Lord. Solomon loved the Lord, and walking in the statutes of his, David his father, only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept him for you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God. You have made your servant king in place of David, my father. Although I am a little child, I do not know how to go in or come out. And your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. So give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people that I may, be discern, I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this, your great people? As you have your seats, 
A little bit of history here. Um, you're going to want to remember this for your Bible history. Solomon's the third king in the history of the nation of Israel. So many promises are coming to fruition right here. Right? God promised Abraham you'd be the father of many nations. And then generations have come and gone. And then we had King, uh, king Saul. was the fir- you know, Well, first Joshua led the conquering of the promised land. And then eventually Saul's there ready to be the first king. But Saul was not postured to receive the blessings that God was giving him. He he was living in disobedience, and therefore he was not in a posture, and so God tore the kingdom from him. And the covenant that could have been for Saul, the first king, was given to King David. And David did walk before the Lord, though he was very flawed. He walked before the Lord with his heart towards the Lord, and always repentant before the Lord when he made some really big mistakes before the Lord. And so God made a covenant with him to continue his kingdom. And then Solomon comes, and he's the fulfillment of that promise to David. And and David and Solomon are the promise to Abraham to have this great nation of God's chosen people. And what I want you to understand is that the story of Solomon is just as much about the generosity of God as it is the wonder of Solomon's kingdom. And here's what I want to do. I want to show you two traits of God's generosity. And then at the end, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how are we going to be postured to receive rather than to block the blessing of the Lord. Does that sound good? Amen, family? Okay, so here's the first. Amen, family? Are you guys... We cool? All right, all right, all right. So, so here's the first trait of the two traits. Number one is that God wants better for you than you want for you. This is a t- character trait of God. You see all throughout the Bible, God consistently leads people to things that are better for them than which they're leading themselves to. Consistently. Why? Because God truly does want better for you than you want for you. 65 times, plus or minus, in the Old Testament, and I'll clarify, I'm not putting you under the law or the Old Testament. Praise God on high that we're in the New Testament in grace by the blood of Jesus. Amen, family. You can, you can worship because of that. You can get in worshiping excitement because of that. But in the Old Testament, God said 65 plus times on repeat, Obey my commands and I will be with you and bless you. In different ways and different phrases, on repeat, 65 plus time, God says to the nation of Israel, Obey my commands so that I can bless you. Right? And here's what he's saying. He's saying, why, or first, first of all, why would he say that? Why would God say repeatedly from generation to generation to generation, Obey my commands and I'll bless you? He said it because he wants to bless them. He desires to bless them. He's he's telling them, listen, there will be a time in your life, and I'm family, I'm telling you, there will be a time in your life where you will be tempted to settle for less than the best that God has in store for you. And God is telling the nation of Israel, when that time comes, be steadfast in obedience because I have blessings for the obedient. 65 times to an entire nation. Why? Because it's his nature to bless. We serve a blessing God, amen? A generous and wonderfully blessing God. And if you can remember this truth that God wants better for you than you want for you, and then you read your Bible and you start paying attention, you're going to realize that this is thematic all throughout the Bible. God is constantly leading people to better things than they were leading themselves to. He interrupts their life to take them to better things than they were pursuing before he interrupted their lives. (coughs) Solomon's time as king is kind of an apex moment in history, in all of history. Listen, during the reign of King Solomon, you see probably the fifth most generous display of God's character ever, okay? There's four things that are pretty equal, and then this is just underneath those four things, okay? Next to the birth of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and the second coming, future coming of Christ, this is the most extravagant display of God's generosity, 
This is a big deal. The reign of King Solomon. Okay? You, you, look at, you, look at this, you look at this passage, and who initiated the conversation? It wasn't Solomon. Solomon wasn't seeking these things for himself. Are you with me, family? He wasn't in a state of prayer asking for these things. He was sleeping. And God interrupted his life in a dream and said, hey, Solomon, by the way, Solomon was in a state of blessing, just like you and I are right now. He was in a state of blessing. He had the kingdom. His dad went great lengths to make sure he had the throne. And he made some questionable decisions right off the bat to make sure he kept the throne. He was already in the blessing, and then God approaches the scene and says, I love you, I loved your father. And I want to add to the blessing you have. What can I do for you? Because I want more for you than you're currently asking and seeking for yourself. I love, this is God's character. We serve a blessing God. I love how John Piper says this. He says it so so powerfully. God does not bless us begrudgingly. There is a kind of eagerness about the beneficence, beneficence of God He does not wait for us to come to him. He seeks us out because it is his pleasure to do us good. God is not waiting for us. He's pursuing us. Amen, family? That, in fact, is the literal translation of Psalm 23, 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall pursue me all the days of my life. He goes on to say this. This is so good. God loves to show mercy. Let me say that again. God loves to show mercy. He is not hesitant or indecisive or tentative in his desire to do good to his people. Here's this last statement. It's so good. His anger must be released by a stiff safety lock, but his mercy has a hair trigger. Let me say that again, okay? His anger must be released by a stiff safety lock, but his mercy has a hair trigger. So so when you and I can grasp this idea and really wrap our minds around it, it's it's mind-blowing that that God loves to show mercy. God delights in blessing because he's a blessing God, that he's not hesitant or indecisive, and that he delights in blessing. You start to notice this is your life, that God interrupted your life. He pursued you and led you to something better than you were leading yourself to. You see this all throughout Scripture. Did Noah go to God or God go to Noah? Noah didn't say, hey God, hey God, let me, let me build a boat for you. Let me spend, you know, lots of years building a boat. God came to Noah and said what? I'm going to use you to preserve humanity. Right? Same with Moses. Moses was quite content to live in a certain sta- station of life, having fled from murdering the uh, Egyptian master, Right? God interrupted his life and appeared in the burning bush and said what? He said, Moses, I've got a job for you to do. And he made him one of the greatest leaders in history. Abraham just wanted a kid. Just give me a baby, God. Then God showed up, said, no, I have something better in store for you, father of many nations. You notice that God went to Samuel. Samuel's trying to sleep too. God just doesn't like his people to sleep. In fact, Samuel ran away three times from God's interruption and ran to Eli. But God continued to pursue him. He said, I've got a job for you too. You'll be one of the most magnificent prophets to ever walk the face of planet Earth. And then God sent Samuel to David to anoint him as king. And now God is appearing to Solomon. In fact, later Solomon gets in trouble from God. And and Solomon is known in Scripture as the man whom God appeared to twice and messed up. Because God is pursuing us. And I don't know uh, what you're going through. But I wonder if anyone here today notices right now God pursuing you offering you something better than you've been leading yourself to. Maybe you've been leading yourself to anxiety and God is interrupting and leading you to peace. 
And you've been leading yourself to and clinging to that anxiety, and God is coming very decisively into your life and saying, no, I have something better for you than you want for yourself. Right? Maybe you've been leading yourself to addiction, and God's interrupting your life and saying, no, I'm leading you to a different kind of high that doesn't use abusive substances, a high by just being delighted in the glory of the Almighty. Or maybe you're leading yourself to pride, and God is leading you to humility, which is a much more satisfying state of being. Amen, family? Maybe God is interrupting your life and you've been leading yourself to laziness and a lethargic lifestyle and God is interrupted and leading you to to work and grind and grow to live up to the potential he designed you for. Maybe you've been leading yourself to isolation and God is leading you to community. I don't know what you're going through, but I believe this. If you're here today and now, that God has and is pursuing you with better things than you're capable of planning for yourself. And right now, I was, I was going to tell, I wanted to tell a story at this point in the sermon to just really kind of get you hooked in there and to see, show you how I've seen this happen time and time again, and I have in people's lives. But here's, here's what I think we need to do right now. Are you ready, family? Let's just pause. Look at our own hearts and answer the question in your privacy of your heart with your Father in heaven who loves you. Is God interrupting your life right now to lead you to something better than you've been leading yourself to? And write that down and keep that and hang on to that and grasp that and don't let it go because what are you going to do about it if God's leading you? Here, let me ask you a second question. When you identify what that is, are you in a posture of receiving or are you rejecting and blocking that blessing he's leading you to? Can I get in everybody's face just a little bit on this? Every person here who claims to love Christ has experienced what I'm talking about. Because there was a time in your life when you were leading yourself to indulge in sin that profaned the name of God and it was contrary to the character of God. There was rebellion against the glory of God and you led yourself to that at one point in time and God intervened and led you to something better than what you were leading yourself to, salvation through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And he interrupted your life and he said, listen, I have something better. I love you so much that I sent my son to die on the cross for your sins, to shed his blood, to wash your sins away, to die on the cross where you deserve to die for the punishment of your sins. And I'm going to wash all of your sins away with the blood of Jesus, raise on the third day so that whoever believes in me will not perish but have everlasting life as well. At one point, if you are in Christ, you experienced God leading you to that better thing that you would not have sought for yourself. And so he interrupted your life with a Bible tract or an evangelist or a family member or a friend or a piece of scripture. I know a guy who got saved, he just felt like he was supposed to read Matthew one day. He opened it up and he gave his life to Jesus just reading the gospel of Matthew. If you are in Christ, you know what I'm talking about. And in Christ, he might be doing something similar, leading you in Christ to something better than you're currently leading yourself to, maybe in an area of your life where you're being rebellious or lazy or lethargic or neglectful. What's amazing is this is God's character. It's his character to bless. Jesus teaches us to think this way. Right? What does Jesus teach us? He teaches there's power in his name. And when he teaches us there's power in his name, what does he tell us to do? Ask for things in his name that you may receive those things. Okay? And before you mishear me, I'm not, pe- I'm not presenting any peace, prosperity, health, wealth gospel to you because we're going to get to that in a little bit. That's not what I'm talking. But I'm just talking about the general concept that Jesus wants you to pursue blessings. One of the best verses, Jesus says this, Matthew 7, 7. He says, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Forever ask receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. And there's theological nuances in there that we could unpack we don't have time for, but at the face level of that, Jesus is encouraging us to seek out blessings with a massive level of intentional pursuit. Right? He didn't just say, just ask for blessing. He says, ask, seek, and knock. 
There's three act, action words there because Jesus is showing you to be incredibly intentional in seeking those things. Are you with me, family? Amen? Why? Because God wants better for you than you want for you. Now here's where we need to get the second trait of God's generosity, that some blessings are side effects of righteous pursuits. Right? Some blessings are side effects than right, of righteous pursuits. What did, what did is, by the way, is anybody starting to change their answer on the question, what if your answer changing a little bit as we go? When, when God offered Solomon anything, what did he ask for? It was the most humble and simple request. God, give me the ability to do my difficult job well. Is that essentially the, the heart of his request? God, please give me the ability to do my difficult job well. You know what's so special about that? You know what some of you and I would have asked for if we were Solomon? We would have asked God to make the difficult job easy. Solomon didn't ask for the difficult job to be easy. He asked for the skills to do the difficult job well. He calls himself a child in verse 7, but he's about 19 or 20 years old. He's no child. He's expressing humility. King Josiah was like eight. He truly could say, I am but a child. Solomon's not. But he didn't ask for the hard job to be easy. He asked for the ability to complete the difficult task. I think it's really special to note right now that so often the command of Jesus to you and to me is to endure, not to find ways to make life easier. It's to endure the difficulty. We don't know what Solomon was thinking, but... But perhaps he watched his dad do this job, right? And perhaps he, he watched, you know, David was a great king, but man, he had a rough leader, a tough, rough time leading, right? And maybe he watched the, the pains that David went through, and he said, he said, God, I know how hard this is to be an okay king, let alone a good king. God, help me. I, I can't do this. Or, or maybe, maybe he watched his dad and his dad, the great king David, who killed his ten thousands and puny Saul, who only killed his thousands. And maybe his dad cast a big shadow on his life. And he's just feeling so inadequate. Or, or maybe, you know, he's already king. Maybe he's already making bad decisions. You read the private previous chapters, you realize he made some questionable choices right off the bat. In fact, verse 3 starts off by saying he loved the Lord, but he made the right sacrifices in the wrong places. There's little nuggets all throughout his life that show that even though he was great and wise and a good king, he had some flaws just like his dad did. So, so maybe, maybe he's like, man, I already mess, I'm already messing up. God, I need, I need some help to do this well. Whatever the reason, Solomon made the good request, the righteous pursuit, just wisdom to rule well. And this pleased the heart of God. Because in verse 11, God says to him, because you have asked this, and you have not asked for yourself for long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but you have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, now I do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has ever been before you and none like you shall ever arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked for both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare to you all your days. And if you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will, walk, I will lengthen your days. Because sometimes blessings are the side effects of righteous pursuits. Sometimes blessings are the side effect of righteous pursuits. So here's what's amazing. Solomon went for the righteous thing rather than the glamorous thing. Solomon went for the righteous thing rather than the easy thing. He went for the righteous thing rather than the self-indulging thing. He went for the righteous thing. He could have asked for any of those other things, and he would have got them, but at the expense of all the other things that he got. He could have asked for wealth, and he would have got wealth. He could have asked for his, the heads of his enemies on spikes, and his enemies would have been obliterated. He could have asked for a long life, and he would have given it. He could have asked for any of those things, but then he wouldn't have got all the other blessings because sometimes the best blessings are the side effects of a righteous pursuit. Amen, family? And I hope, I hope your life is filled with stories of right now you're starting to realize that you've been living this truth the whole time and you just didn't even know it. 
He pursued the righteous thing, and so God gave him what he asked for, and then also all the other things. But listen, because God wanted better for him than he wanted for himself, he didn't just give him wisdom to do the job well. He gave him supreme wisdom so that no other man in the history of the world will ever have the wisdom that Solomon had. And two bonus blessings that were unconditional and one bonus blessing that was conditional. Riches and honor, that was an unconditional blessing that God promised him. And a longer life was conditional on him continuing to walk in the footsteps of David. Some blessings are the side effects of righteous pursuits. And Jesus teaches us to think this way. Matthew 6, 33, what's he say? He talks about the basic necessities of life. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Again, let me, let me, let me re-articulate. This is not a health, wealth, peace, prosperity, you just need to be your best you gospel message. It's not what this is about. This is about righteous pursuit of blessings and being postured to receive the good blessings instead of greedy for bad ones. Right? That's what this is about. Okay? This is, this is about us pursuing righteous things and picking up the bonus blessings along the way rather than pursuing worldly things and passing up righteousness along the way. Am I losing you guys on this one? Because sometimes the best blessings are side effects of the righteous pursuit. And, and here's what's funny. If you're pursuing righteousness, you're going to be okay with whatever anyways. Jesus tells us what? In the Beatitudes, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. So if you are pursuing the righteous thing rather than the greedy thing or the worldly thing or the selfish thing or the self-righteous thing, if you're pursuing the righteous thing, you're going to be okay with whatever hand you're given. Because those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied and you'll be okay with whatever blessing because you will just find yourself with a new value system where all you want is Jesus. And if all you get is Jesus and all you have is Jesus, then you have all the things you want and all the things you need. And no other blessing matters because you just want Jesus for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied and that will be you. <laughs> Praise God on high for that. Some of the best blessings are side effects of righteous pursuits. In fact, there's data on this. You pursue the righteous thing and you'll get a good thing. Here's, here's one of my favorite examples with data. It's marriage related. There's a little known study from 1997 that shows that couples who pray together on a regular basis, only one, less than 1% of them get divorced. Do you want to know how cool the number is? One out of 1,152 couples that pray together on a regular basis, get divorced. So you pursue a righteous relationship and you end up with a healthy relationship as a side effect. And there's other data that, that explains that. Test, test this theory, okay? Do this. Do me, you guys want to do me a big favor this week? Man, I'm good at game. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, you guys, all right. Here, here's the favor, okay? Just study the scripture, read the Bible until the Lord convicts you. Don't, like, if it takes you days, just read your Bible for days until Jesus convicts you of something. And when he shows you a righteous trait to pursue, pursue it and then just watch what side effects come of it. Do this. Do this. Okay, you know what? Talk to one person about Jesus every day for the next 30 days with love, kindness, and compassion. Just, you don't even, just whatever happens, just talk to one person about Jesus every day for the next 30 days and then take, tra take an inventory, keep track of the side effects of that. See how many friends you make, see how many people you lead to Jesus, see, see how blessed you are, see how good you are at taking rejection, something you're probably not good at. Just find a, figure out what kind of satisfying side effects come from the righteous pursuit. I wonder how many people will actually do that this week. See, some, some of us, we hunger and thirst for righteousness, and then God pours it into our hands, and we just let it slip through because we're not pursuing the righteous thing he put, called us to. We want to see everybody get saved, but we don't want to talk to them about Jesus. And, and let's be honest in our heart. What we say when we do that is, is we value our comfort more than we do their soul. So let's get over ourselves, okay? So Solomon, God used him to give us a glimpse. Here, here's what's amazing. Side effect of the righteous pursuit 
Remember, there's four moments in history, past and present, that are better than this display of God's generosity. The birth of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and the future return of Christ are the only four times in history that could really compare with the reign of King Solomon. The side effect of King Solomon's righteous pursuit was that planet Earth and the nation of Israel got a little preview of heaven. The tiniest preview, but a preview nonetheless, because under Solomon's reign... The people were so blessed that there was no want and no war. God ruled from the temple. He was their God. They were his people. He ruled from the temple and they lived in his blessing. It was, the time, it was an imperfect piece, a slice of heaven, but it was a taste. I want you guys to understand this. This is how Scripture describes them. 1 Kings 4.25, the next chapter over. Throughout the days of Solomon, Judah and Israel dwelt securely from Dan to Beersheba, and each man under his own vine and under his own fig tree. He's, what, they're, what they're articulating is that they were so blessed under the rule of Solomon that everybody was okay by themselves. That the kingdom was cared for by God's provision. The, the rumors were so grand that, that, that uh, royalty from four nations would come and visit because the, the, the rumors were so spectacular that they were prepared to be disappointed and wanted to disprove the hype. And when they came, everybody left blown away because the grandiose splendor of the, of the kingdom of Solomon was so wonderful that, that no rumor could actually do it justice. It couldn't live up to the hype. It always surpassed the hype. Are you with me, family? This was the reign of King Solomon. Because sometimes there are side effects to the righteous pursuit. In fact, often. He was, he was so wealthy. You guys want to know how wealthy he was? He was so wealthy that if you adjust for inflation, he would have been worth at least $2.3 trillion. That is enough money to add Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos' fortunes together and then multiply it by five. Okay? Add them together, multiply it by five. That's how well off they were as a, just a side effect of the righteous pursuit. What am I telling you today? Am I telling you that you ask for the righteous thing and you're going to be a trillionaire? That's not what today's about. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> That's why everybody's been so quiet. They've been taking notes trying to figure out, okay, like, Where's the catch? How do I get the money? <laughs> How do I get the money? <laughs> well, for just five payments of nineteen ninety-five. <laughs> That's not what it's about. Okay. <laughs> Here, here's what I really want to get to, though. Okay. This is a difficult message for many to hear because. Some of us don't really want Jesus. Some of us don't want righteousness, and some of us don't want wisdom. So if, if the things we study today are true, if God is a generous God, and if he wants better for you than you want for you, and if there are side effects to the righteous pursuit, if these things are true, then why do we keep balking the blessings he's giving us? Right? That's what we really need to talk about. If, if these things are true, let's develop a posture of receiving rather than a posture of bl bl blocking or just letting the things that God's pouring into our laps slip through our fingers. Amen, family? Like these things are true, then let's live like they're true. Listen, I want for you the God, things God wants for you because God will only give you good things. And if he's calling you to give something up, it's because it's good for you to give up. If he's calling you to pick something up, it's because it's good for you to pick it up. Even if it's difficult. God might give you good things that are painful things because they're still good things. Okay? So if we believe this, then let's live like we believe it. James 4.3 says, When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Contrary to the goal of receiving for God's glory. Amen? And so this is why it's so difficult. Because some of us would hear this message, and here's what we think. We think, okay, but I've been doing this. 
I'm asking God for the good things in the right ways at the right times in the right place. And I watch this wicked, Jesus-hating person live the life that I dream of. And their life looks easy while my life is filled with struggle. That's, is that really what some of us think when we hear this? Let me ask you a brutal question, okay? Are you really jealous of the wicked, Jesus-hating person regardless of what life they're living? Let me ask that in a different way. Are you in any way, shape, or form jealous of someone living without Jesus? Not if we believe what we say we believe. Because if you are jealous of someone living without Jesus, regardless of their station in life, okay, are you sure you're, you know the same Jesus I know? Because the Jesus that I know, and if you know the Jesus I know, and you're living in the blessing of having a relationship with the Lord Almighty, then no pleasure, prosperity, wealth, or wonder this world has to offer can even hold a candle next to the joy of knowing Jesus. Because you are blessed right now with every blessing you could dream or conceive. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what? The good blessings God has prepared for those who love him. So let's stop blocking the blessing, amen? Let's stop blocking the blessing. And this is the problem, I already said it, that if we're honest, some of us do not want wisdom or righteousness or Jesus. Some of us, here's what we really want if we're honest. We want our enemies to get what's coming to them. Not to extend the mercy that we've received. Wait, some of us, here's what we want. We want wealth, be, not to glorify God, but so that we don't have to worry if God will provide. Right? Some of us, we want a longer life. Not to praise Jesus longer, but because we're scared of death. Some of us, we want honor for ourselves rather than to shine a spotlight into heaven to declare the goodness of God. Right? What we need is Jesus, and Jesus alone, and satisfaction in just being with Jesus, and satisfaction in just asking for whatever the righteous thing is to glorify Him. What we need is just satisfaction in just growing more deeply in love with Him. That's what we need. So let's put ourselves in a posture of receiving rather than blocking the blessing. Amen, family? If these things are true, amen? Amen, family? Amen, family? You can get excited and praise Jesus for his goodness. Amen, family? Okay. And so here's what I want to do. I want to, I want to close with this. I want to give you one thought and one question that will help you reposture yourself to receive rather than block the blessing or let it slip through your fingers. Are you ready for this? Okay. So often, we convince ourselves on what to do or what to get or what not to get or what not to do based on if it's right or wrong. But in honor of King Solomon's righteous pursuit, I'm going to give you a better question. Don't ask if it's right or wrong anymore. Ask if it's wise or not. Ask if it's wise, not if it's right or wrong. Here, here's, here's what I know about every one of you, and I do it too, right? I've talked myself into all of my best bad ideas. <laughs> because I think all my ideas are good ideas. And you think all of them are good ideas too. You think all my ideas are good ideas too. And you think all of your ideas are good ideas. And here's what, here's what we have the capacity to do. If it's almost wrong, we'll convince ourselves that it's okay. Right? And if it's questionably wrong, we'll find a way to justify why it was okay to do it. Right? So sometimes it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. Just ask if it's wise or not. Listen, there are things that are not wrong, but, are not, but they are also not wise. It is not wise for me to eat dessert with every meal. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I'm quite happy with that. But it's not wise for that, right? Um, I have a baby on the way, so we kind of downsized our car situation. It's not wrong for me to go get a different car now that I just got rid of one of our cars. It's not wise to go get another car now that we got rid of another car. It's not wise, but it's not wrong. So listen, sometimes it's not about what's right or wrong. It's about what's wise, and sometimes... The wise answer is the one that leads to the biggest blessing rather than the right or wrong one. I borrowed that from Andy Stanley. has a great book on five questions to help you make better decisions. And so, here's my question for you. With whatever the Lord has put on your heart today, 
what's the wise thing? If, if what we said is true, and truth is really truth, and God is really God, then something that we've talked about today is a lesson for you to learn and to hang on to. So what's your wisest next step, not the right or wrong next step? For some of you, it might be as simple as this, that you've been coming to church for a long time, but you've never given Jesus your heart. And the wise thing to do is to stop keeping it from him. Right? Some of you, for a long time, you've heard the gospel so many times, you respect the existence of God, you fear the wrath of God, but you do not love Jesus. And today may be the day to say, Jesus, I'm... I love you. My heart's yours. My life is yours. I surrender everything to you. That might be the wise next step for you today. The wise next step for you today might be something as simple as, I just need to have a tough conversation with somebody that I've been neglecting to have. It's not right or wrong to skip it, but it's the wise thing to do. The wise thing might, to, to be, the wise thing might be to, to stop something or start something, even if you don't want to. I don't know, but I know you do. Right now, I know that the whole, I believe the Holy Spirit is giving you perfect clarity on what the wise thing is that's next for you. And so, Father God, we praise you. And we plead with you. Father, give us the strength, the courage, the energy, the diligence, the determination, the discipline to do the wise thing, even when it's the hard thing. And God, through the pursuit of wisdom and the hunger and thirst for righteousness, we know that you will give us satisfaction. So anybody here right now who's never surrendered their life to you, they've never given their heart to you, Lord, they've never put their faith in you, they've only always just respected you from a distance, I pray that they would cry out to you right now and that they would come and pray with me after the service. We could just talk and celebrate what we know heaven's celebrating right now, that they could cry out to you, Lord, I acknowledge I'm a sinner, but I'm grateful that you're a Savior. I know I am guilty of many sins against your glory. But I also know that you died on the cross to wash away my sins. And so I receive the gift of forgiveness now, today, and forever. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead and he resurrected me as well. So Lord, I am yours. My heart, my life, my affections, my decisions, my determination, my will is yours, Father, and I surrender to you. And I pray that somebody's praying that right now and they're just crying out to you in their heart and that we can celebrate with heaven. They make themselves known before they leave. And Father, everybody else who has a next step to make, give us clarity and let's do it. Because you called us to be the church and the church is a people in action for your glory out of our affections for you. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you stand for the next song,